So we are now recording. Um, welcome everyone. So today we have our second guest speaker for the series, let's talk about ID project management. And our guest speaker today is Adriana McKinnon. And Adriana is the director of logistics for Park Street Companies, which is um, an organization that we have had like a really long history with between the IDT program and Park Street. We have had several alumni who have worked with Adriana and her team as instructional designers um, and interns. And in fact, we, are, we have someone who's working at Park Street Companies right now, uh, our alumni, Teddy Marcello. So welcome Adriana to uh, our classroom and it's great to have you here. Thank you, thank you so much. Can you tell us a little bit about your educational and professional background? Yes, so I, I am a US licensed uh, customs broker. I have a bachelor's degree from Ecker College and a certification in logistics from Florida International University. And as far as my professional background, um, it's funny, I originally started going to school for marketing and finance and right around 2008, there was a, a huge economic downfall. And during that economic downfall, I found the only job that I could possibly find and it turned out to be in, in logistics and customs brokerage and long story short, I ended up falling in love with it, uh, sticking to it and then later on certifying in logistics and then also um, becoming a, a licensed customs broker. And I'm not sure if anyone in this classroom is particularly um, interested, I doubt it because everyone here is an instructional designer, but in I, I don't know if you know exactly what this entails, but it's basically international trade, everything that is import, export, and on the customs brokerage side, um, uh, it's everything that is related to the liability of an importer in terms of paying taxes, duties, and any other fees to the U.S. government in order to legalize product that comes in from a foreign country for U.S. commerce. So that's basically what I do. I've been doing it for um, about 10, 11 years. And before that, I was also in logistics, but it was more, um, was a lot more fun. It was event logistics uh, for a, a large hotel chain. Wonderful. We actually do have someone with a similar background, uh, Kate, <laughs> who is uh, originally from uh, Estonia. Um, she was, oh. she worked in logistics before coming into the program. So, oh, that's great. yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so I'm going to unshare my screen and then you can uh, share yours and we can go from there. Okay, perfect. Okay. I just need a couple of seconds to my screens. Sorry, I work with three screens and I just want to make sure that I use the right one. That's so much real estate. I'm jealous. <laughs> okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I, the, please don't think about um, this as an actual presentation. It's more of a, of a brief introduction to project management from a very personal perspective. It doesn't necessarily always have to be like this, but I think it follows the basic uh, groundwork of any project management um, task that, anyone can put together in, in any type of company or any type of um, industry or service line. So I'm sure that this is no surprise, but the need for project management has been driven by businesses that have realized the benefits of organizing work around projects and putting the right people 
um, behind these projects. So um, I wanted to just quickly go over the characteristics of, of a project, what I, the definition of a project, and finally, what the role of a project manager is. And as instructional designers, and I think I didn't mention this during the, my introduction, but uh, long story short, uh, three years ago, I volunteered myself to put together a training department in the company that I work for, which when I started working there, they were a 35, pe uh, 35 employee company, and they're now 250 employees plus. And as the company grew, the need for training became more apparent and not only internal training, but also external training because we have a large client base that is international. So a very interesting sample of um, learners um, in different ways of absorbing information. Uh, so volunteered myself to do this just because I, I had an idea of what training entails, but by no means am I an instructional designer. Uh, and thankfully I was able to hire a content manager and um, Teddy, woman Neil that uh, Dr. Romero just mentioned. And um, the presentation that I put together here is inspired in what we have done at the training level. So if you have any questions that relate to training, you can ask me and, and I'll do my best to, to answer. So whenever we're given a project, uh, to manage. I think that probably the most important part is to figure out if it's really a project that needs to be managed or if you don't really need to put that much work behind it. And believe it or not, especially in larger corporations, that's a constant problem. Uh, too many meetings, too many hands in the pod, uh, too many people who do not have a clear objective. So I put this together so that uh, we can keep uh, these items into consideration uh, whenever you want to decide if a project is a project or if it's a task that can just be assigned to a particular person. So number one, when we have a project in front of us, the objectives are going to be clear. Um, there won't be, it's either you're going to go one way or we're going to go another way. It's either acquiring a new software and implementing it uh, across the board. Um, it's making a connection and hiring a group overseas uh, to service a particular service line uh, or creating trainings uh, at a large scale for a particular group. Um, there will be constraints of cost, quality, and time. There will be a cost. Um, there will be a fixed time scale. Um, you will have to work on a budget it's not typically a project is not something that can typically be done by a single person so you have to put a team of people together um, you will not have too much time to practice or rehearse for a project because as you put it together you could quickly come into the transition um, the transition stage and i'll talk about it in a second when i kind of walk you through the what the flow chart for a project typically looks like um, there is some change and uncertainty, and I'll probably mention this later, but typically project management comes in with surprises. And at, at the end and in the middle of developing a project, you learn that um, as a project manager, you will have to adjust and be a creative thinker um, to bring about solutions. And ultimately, projects differentiate themselves from tasks because they're unique. Right? So it's something that will ha make you lay the foundation for many other things. So like I mentioned, whenever we want to define a project, we want to make sure it's, yes, Dr. Romero. I was just gonna say, I love that you're using RISE for the presentation. It's really right. nice. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. The very little I know about Rice, uh, Teddy taught me. <laughs> he's doing a good job. Uh, he's, amazing. he's amazing. Great. He's a great asset for a company. Um, project management typically constitutes a, a sum of different tasks, and it will have a beginning and an end. So 
why do I mention that? It's because as a project manager, your only uh, involvement will be to manage. The project manager is not typically the person to actively perform any of the tasks that fall under that particular project. But I think what's very important in creating a project is the accountability of a project manager in terms of the relationship with all other stakeholders. Um, why? Because once the project is complete, the most important part is to just pass it on to whoever will manage the, you know, what you completed for uh, until forever. Um, project management uses various tools to measure accomplishments and track project tasks. These include work breakdown structures, uh, Gantt charts, and for example, in, in my particular case, we use Scrum. I don't know if you've ever worked with Scrum. And um, we also use Jira, which you know, we use to, to develop different products. We are actually um, going to, we're reading a book as part of the class, um, mm -hmm. which is about Scrum. And we're gonna discuss it after our, our you our guest speaker. And uh, we did two weeks ago, the students did um, like an analysis of different project management tools. Mm -hmm. And I think, didn't Jira come up? Somebody mentioned it. Or was it our last guest speaker that mentioned Jira? I, that, I know that has been brought up before. It was brought up, I just don't remember. Yeah, it was brought up before, but I couldn't remember. I think it was our last guest speaker. So, okay. Yeah, Anu says it was the last guest speaker. So I guess Jira is a very popular project management tool? Yes, it is increasingly popular. I personally like it better than other tools out there that are more visual because Jira allows you to interact with, um, with other stakeholders in the same platform without having to move. And it's, it's a lot easier, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, of course. Uh, projects frequently need resources on an ad hoc basis, as opposed to organizations that have only dedicated full-time positions. So it will not be rare that um, you have to do some uh, resource research and, and bring someone from outside for just a specific project, or you have to pull, pull people from other departments, typically subject matter experts. And um, I don't know if we'll come down to this question. I think Dr. Romero asked me this when we were preparing for this meeting, but we talked about what were some of the main uh, challenges of working in projects. And that is one of the main challenges that uh, in the majority of um, project management scenarios, you'll have to pull subject matter experts from different departments and have them adhere to the expectations for that particular project in spite of their own um, their own agenda, right? So sometimes that, that can become a bit difficult. Um, and ultimately project management reduces the risk and, and increases chances of success. And all of these items are just to be kept in mind when we begin phase one, the initiation process of any project. Um, the greatest challenge of project management is integrating and controlling the components of each single project. So one, you have to stay within budget. And I know this sounds easy, but sometimes it isn't this easy because we have to pay from outside because we have to buy access to a platform because we need certain software because we have to go uh, or, or travel internationally to meet with stakeholders. So different things come about that uh, are best if thought about in anticipation to even beginning the project. And um, we just have to be very careful as to how we build our, our budget. Uh, projects must be delivered on time. And this is a really big one for uh, instructional designers, just because uh, in instructional design, you're always working around the clock, right? So, and, and you have specific deadlines that need to be met. And if they're not met, especially at the corporate level, it will affect other departments that either have to hire people or are waiting on you or will need to hire from bring people from other departments to complete the training if the training is not completed on time. 
um, projects must be within scope. scope. Um, I think that one is somewhat self-explanatory, but it's just like when in freshman English we're beginning to learn sentences. I don't know if you remember your freshman year, but sometimes you write a sentence and the sentence is too broad and the t teacher sends it back to you and you have to narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down. And it kind of is the same uh, type of thought process when it comes to project management where you have to narrow down the idea and make sure that there is a scope uh, in, in the, a, a specific set of tasks that perpetuate throughout the project um, as opposed to adding on new things as you get creative throughout the process, which it happens. Um, and last but not least, they must meet the customer quality requirements, whoever your, cust your customer is, whether it's a school um, or your students, uh, or if you work uh, in a corporation, you know, eventual learners. Does anyone have any questions so far? Um, I have a question. One of the conversations that we have, uh, the very first day we met, it, we talked about client expectations. So what if the client doesn't know what they want? How do you, how do you manage that situation? How do you continue a good relationship with your client while still like bringing them to like clarity of what the project should be or what they ought to get out of the project? That's a great question. So typically clients come to you or they, they come to us because of our expertise and they're expecting um, the project manager or the instructional designer to tell them what they need. And what I would personally just suggest to base it on is on asking a lot of questions because sometimes clients don't, are unable to conceptualize what they want, but they do know, or they have a, a vision of how things should be. So asking a lot of questions about what their ultimate goal is, uh, how they envision the future of their, their, in the case of a corporation, the, of their company or of their brand, and what are the ages and then what kind of um, target, um, I guess in the case of instructional design, it's not a, a target market, but it's more of a, the student age and the demographic that we're working with, which for example, at Park Street, from a training perspective, we have um, uh, the, the average age is 30 years old. And when we started the training project, the average age of the company was 27 years old. And basically all millennials, right? And the struggle there was as training started being created, we realized that the trainings created didn't have the, the right scope. They, they didn't, they weren't sticking. The information wasn't sticking. They looked great, but the information wasn't being absorbed the way that we wanted it. So we had to change a little bit more towards uh, micro learning uh, and towards the type of learning that we were working with, learner that we were working with at that time. Uh, but finally, because we also create external trainings for our clients, and our clients come from a variety of uh, European countries and are of uh, an older age, the training for our clients is completely different than the training that we now use for um, what we call our internal clients. So, but it's a uh, company employees. Can you give us like a brief example? Like what, what would be for something that's young? Like, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, what's the difference between something you create for somebody younger than someone who's mm -hmm. older? So I feel, um, so based on experience, really, uh, we've seen that the millennial generation um, and zillennials as well absorb information that's in infographics a lot better, that's in short videos of two or three and a half, three and a half minutes is a lot, um, tops, as opposed to sharing a five-page PDF or even a presentation with different slides um, that they have to read and that they have to go through. It's uh, they're looking for just the, the, the basic information. And then if that 
piques the learner's curiosity, they will on their own uh, willingly search more, right? But if the, the main idea doesn't attract the learner, uh, the, that particular generation, in my opinion, is a, a lot quicker to just uh, drop it uh, and, and go on to the next thing. And something else is we've had to block the learner's ability to jump from one training to the other without having completed the first one fully because we did notice that especially in the, the younger groups, um, because we have some groups of large groups of interns, they're 20, 21, 22. Uh, they just wanted things very quickly and they were going a lot faster because their goal was to finish a training as opposed to really absorbing the information. Thank so. you, Adriana. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so I went over the integration of the components of each single project. And you will see these uh, four items everywhere and in every single thing that um, any project that you complete. Um, and also the project life cycle, which is very simple. And I think it's self-explanatory. I think it's also uh, very similar to the life cycle of an instructional designer where you meet, you gather the content and, and you know, ask questions, design. So I feel that if as an instructional designer, you're also a project manager, you can do both uh, at the same time. Uh, first part of any project is the initiation. And I put the main steps here, but it's really extensive because this is where all of the questions come in, right? And if your client, as Dr. Romero mentioned, doesn't know uh, what he or she wants, this is when we have to get together to, to formulate uh, an idea. And I typically like to think about it as a house, right? And right now we're going to think about the foundations of the house and the shell of the house. We're not thinking about the doorknobs, we're not thinking about the doors, the flooring, none of that, the walls. We're just thinking about the outside. Um, so during the initiation where we ask all the questions, we develop a business case um, and the, typically have someone who writes and takes on all the notes, identify the scope, so exactly where it is that we're looking to go. And most importantly, we identify the stakeholders. So how many teams are going to be associated with each particular project? Uh, who are going to be the subject matter experts? What is going to be their level of involvement? And most importantly, and this is more from a, maybe a personal opinion, it's who's going to be accountable for what. And I um, think accountability in project management is top priority. If uh, nobody wants to take accountability, nothing's going to happen. Any questions? So after we have all this information, then we move on to doing the planning. So that's when we create a workflow, either a workflow document or a chart. Um, and sometimes it's a, a whole analysis and study. We gather all the resources. We come up with a, a budget presented to whoever needs to approve the budget. Uh, we assess and reassess all possible risks and alternatives and really asking ourselves questions during this particular process is very important. Um, and I very often see that groups or subject matter experts fail to put themselves in a position where they ask, oh, what if this doesn't work, right? What would we do? And so, and we get stuck, right, in the middle, like, oh, you know, B didn't work and we don't have a, a plan C. So um, we have to kind of restart the project and it delays the process. And again, we're working with deadlines. Um, at that point, we present a project briefing to whoever is our, uh, our customer or, or if corporation to our boss and we select equipment and, and the resources. And this is basically, so depending on the type of project that we're working on, I think in, in your case, in the case of an instructional designer, the, the, the development of a project would also fall under the, the planning part because when it comes to corporate projects, it's more where um, after putting all of this together and knowing what we're going to do, the project is basically complete. And then we move on to executing the project. So we have 
all the ideas, we have the money, we have the people, we have the subject matter experts, we have a work uh, a workflow, we have dates, uh, deadlines, and uh, a set of accountability on a per person basis. So we set up the organization, we have our specs, we review our design, um, and that, that's when we start verifying performance. We uh, monitor the progress, and this is where I think in project management, you would typically pick a, a sample um, and only test the new product with a, a specific group, but you haven't launched it company-wide or school-wide, or you haven't shared your, your training with everyone yet. Um, and so you start monitoring, and if it works, then you continue the expansion. Um, during the execution, we typically work on forecasting and reporting as well. And eventually we deliver the result of, of the project. And finally, uh, we have closure. We settle the account, analyze all final results. Um, we review the project, close all records, pay everything that needs to be paid uh, and transfer the responsibility to whoever will manage a particular project um, for the long run. And at least at a corporate level, we deliver a final report of you know, what we have done. Uh, and just a quick note, a project is never ever complete without an analysis. So I think a quick tip here is to always monitor each stage to, uh, to systemize each particular stage instead of thinking about the whole project. If you think of everything that you have to do, you will get overwhelmed. So it's one of those things that we have to take one day at a time, right? And I know it sounds very simplistic explained like this, but there are projects that take two years. So I just um, last week finished a project that, that took two years to, to put together, uh, which was opening up a warehouse in, in Europe for the company. So it was an extensive project with a lot of stakeholders and um, we were, thankfully we made it right at the deadline, even with, with COVID. So, and last but not least is what's your involvement as a project manager? So what is expected of, of a PM? And it's one, the definition of a project, reducing it to uh, manageable tasks and obtaining uh, the resources. So I think something that's important uh, in project management is to having a good hold of your network and staying connected. Um, you never know who knows the, exactly what you're going to, to need two, three, five, ten years from now. Um, so it's very important to, to keep your eyes open for uh, good components uh, for your network and to also keep yourself a good component for other people's networks. Um, set the final goal for the project and motivate your team to complete it. And this part can be very challenging because when you pull subject matter experts from other departments, they're not always going to be happy about it. They already have a full plate um, and we're going to give them something else to do. And especially as uh, in the, the position of instructional designers, that is a constant because you have to work with people who work in completely different things and who have no idea of what is expected of them uh, in terms of either providing you with content or reviewing uh, trainings that you created or giving you their feedback or you know, giving you ideas. So that one is important. Uh, the project manager is expected to inform all stakeholders of progress on a regular basis. And I think that one is also very important in terms of deciding when it's a phone call and when it's a meeting. And when it comes to being a project manager, um, meetings are always favored. So as a PM, try to meet with your customer and with your team, at least on a weekly basis to understand their progress and to fix any bottlenecks that you can find um, in your way. And then, like I mentioned at the very beginning, and I think it's good to end like this, it's a no project ever goes exactly as planned, so you have to really stay with a, you know, keep an open mind as, as you work through your project. 
And that's about it. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. Um, Victoria has a question. Go ahead and unmute Victoria. I have a question about budgeting. I'm super new to budgeting. I've never really done it before. <laughs> so I guess my one question is, do you often leave any kind of leeway when you're managing a project in the beginning and trying to figure out how much everything's going to cost? Do you leave a little bit aside just in case? And then just what is your best advice in general for someone who's starting to learn budgeting? So that's typically going to depend on the corporation you work with um, or if you're working with a, a school and how that particular school functions. Now, I can answer from uh, a corporate perspective. Typically, we want to leave the least amount possible for cushions. So the expectation is that we are as close as possible to to the original budget expectation. Um, yet when there is a project, there's always an understanding that things can happen and can end up costing more money, but it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be a surprise. So for example, um, if you're developing a project and you're going to purchase a software for a particular project and that software is $25,000, um, and you want to think in terms of what is the client looking for and if you think that that software is perfect for them or if there is something else that's better but that is not currently under budget, you can also include it in the budget and show it as an alternative and say, hey, this is what I have, this is what I budgeted for. This other program has much better features um, based on your budget expectations. Um, doesn't look like we can afford it right now, but it's an option in case something here doesn't work. So you will be looking at a possible 15, 20, 30K more at the end of a project. So I think just anticipating the possibility is a lot better than not anticipating at all. And also whenever anyone uh, starts working with a budget that typically comes with training. So it will be very unlikely that you will be thrown into budget responsibilities without without a lot of training and, and having a good idea of what either the corporation or, or the school you work with um, expects from you in terms of spending. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, Carla? Go ahead. Hi, um, so my question is, I don't know if you can hear me well, yes? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so which of the four steps would you say typically takes longer or does it really depend on the project? Um, I think it's typically the planning process, what takes longer and also sometimes the initiation because it is during the initiation that there is the most uncertainty where, oh, we don't know if we can have uh, the support of this team or if we have to hire and you have to wait two months to find the perfect hire or if your customer doesn't know what they want and you started the project and you had to stop because they weren't sure if they wanted to go for it or not. So um, if there's any contracting, any type of documentation that needs to go back and forth between you and, and legal counsel, uh, proprietary information, all of that would happen during, during initiation. So depending on the project, the first two stages are the two most difficult. Um, I have a question. Okay, so how do you motivate other individuals to take part in a project, although they may already have other responsibilities? How do they take on that additional task? How do you, what do you tell them? That is a very great question. You have to tell them what's in it for them. So um, something that we do, at least in the training department, is uh, the, the content manager often tells them that after that training is complete, they will never have to sit down with a person and spend uh, for, for one month or one month or two months, two, three, four hours per day, guiding them through information that will be graded and that can be repeated every time. Um, that's number one. The number two is offering, if, if you're able to, offering exposure to other people within the company 
and if within your hands also opportunity because project management is one of the best ways to shine in any type of corporation that's where you can showcase your personal abilities and your professional skills so in my personal opinion if anyone is given a, a you know a, an invitation to be part of a project they should jump to it um, but i think that it feels like the more time people are in a company the more hesitant they are to participate because they look at it from a time perspective but they are not seeing the investment that they're making in their own career so having that conversation and being very open and and telling them what you have to offer when that is complete um what the company has offered is in my opinion the best way of approaching motivating other employees thank you adriana um i have another question and this came up with our last speaker um, because all our speakers are females <laughs> uh, and and I think that's a really wonderful team because uh, all of my students in this class are female so one question I have for you have you ever encountered um, a situation in which your gender uh, was a factor on how people dealt with you or like did did you ever encounter a situation in which you have to like you felt challenged or how is it for a female in a project management leadership position any advice or guidance that you can provide yes so to be very honest with you i work in two very male dominated industries one is the wine and spirits industry it's 90% males and also logistics whenever i go to a conference in logistics i'm typically the only woman. Uh, if, if not, you know, I'll find five more and then the rest are, are all males. So to answer your question, yes, um, it, it is something that happens. And especially I felt when I was younger and I, I knew less and I was taking more chances, I felt uh, a little less validated. Um, I don't know if it was exactly because of my gender more than because clients were a little hesitant to, to invest in someone who seemed young or, or who has a you know, young sounding voice, <laughs> but um, uh, it's, it's a matter of being very well prepared. And also if at any point um, I felt that I, I wasn't being validated, I simply made it clear. So I, I, in a nice way, but uh, it, it, can, it can always be clarified that, that you have the, the credibility to, to perform. Thank you, Adriana. Does anyone have any other questions here in the classroom or Anu, if you have any other questions? Uh, Anu says curiosity. Um, okay. I oh, go ahead, Anu. <laughs> Actually, forgot the idea of muting myself. I was just gonna keep typing. <laughs> Hi, Rana. So, uh, I was just curious, basically, about how I know there has been a question. I think Dr. Hall had asked something similar to what was on my mind about how to get everybody motivated. But would you mind sharing, like, a typical example of? I'm sorry, um, I'm not using my video right now. My lights are off. No problem. Yeah. So. Um, I'm just curious about typical example you could give of um, just practical issues, you know, within the team to get everybody um, to finish a project successfully, or sometimes mm -hmm. when a hiccup just unexpectedly happened, possibly it's even difficult to say this is nobody particularly responsible, it's just unexpected hiccups. How does a typical, you know, just professionally, how do you handle that with any particular example, just to make it as real and possible? Okay. Thank you. Uh, no problem. So I think every manager develops their very own style with experience and, and with you know, the right exposure. So maybe 10 years ago, I would have given you a completely different type of response. But my approach to uh, motivating uh, and also trying to stay within that line is 
to open the gates for communication with my team at all times. And if for any reason, and also um, KPIs, obviously we, we work on a KPI basis. So every single day we have to enter our, our system and everyone puts in what they have done. And I've, I've created a, yes, Dr. Romero. K KPIs. Yes, key performance indicators. Okay. Can you just tell us like a little bit of what that is? Yes, of course, of course. Um, so it's a quantifiable uh, way of, um, of managing performance. So for example, um, an instructional designer works on at Park Street, maybe working at in 20 to 33 or 35 projects at the same time. So we have a spreadsheet and each project has a, depending on, on the amount of content that goes behind each project, um, each project will have a numerical weight. So we're working on a project that weights 20 points, right? Um, so they will go in into the system every morning and put in, I'm working out of my 33 projects on four that are 20 points, three that are five, so many that are 15 and so on. So that when I go into our system, I can visualize everyone's progress in a numerical manner. And at the end of every quarter, we can also see whether we're performing or if there's something that indicates that, that you know, work is not being completed for any reason. And um, going back to Anu's question where she was asking if, um, how we can motivate employees and, and follow up and make sure that we stay within deadline is KPIs are going to be very important in, in making sure that they're, um, that they're performing uh, as expected. But if they're not, uh, my personal approach is to always ask, uh, how can I help you, right? What can I give you? Are you missing any tools? And I have been surprised myself with using that method that many times people are simply afraid of speaking up because they feel that they're not meeting expectations by asking questions. Um, and they will tell, oh, you know, I, I really want to do this, but I haven't been able to get confirmation from, from this department on whether the product that I created is ready to be launched or not, or if you have to make edits or not. And so all they need is just a liaison, but sometimes they're just, I, I don't say afraid, but maybe a little embarrassed to ask questions uh, and they want to do it on their own, but um, sense of urgency is also important. So I'm um, asking, and then uh, Anu was asking for, for a, an actual example. And I have a, a good example. We're working on a compliance training just very recently. And the, the, the person feeding the content to our training department is going on maternity leave in one week. And we completed the training a month ago and it was very difficult. She's our subject matter expert, but she's not able to get to, to the training. So we did exactly what I just mentioned. We reached out and, and asked if there was anything that we could cater to her so that we, we got it completed by the deadline. And she said, look, I'm, I'm extremely uh, backed up with this other project and we find her a solution for the side project so that she could concentrate and, and just help her with the prioritization of, of what was needed behind this particular project we're working on. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great feedback, thank you. Um, I found the idea of Sorry if I, KPIs, um, interesting. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of government contracting where you have to provide information on like tasks that you are performing for a specific days. And actually I believe it's almost like almost hourly that you have to do it because that's the way they build the different projects. Mm -hmm. um, is that integrated into the project management um, tool that you use, Jira, or is that something separate that the organization has on their own? It's separate, um, and to be honest, the there is a, a KPI 
program called Gees, which anyone can do a you know can log in and, and do a free trial so that you can kind of visualize what it entails. Um, but the majority of companies create their own corporate KPIs and then each team also has its own KPIs and we keep it um, on Excel or, or Google Sheets or but it's typically just an Excel program type. Uh, we used to use a platform, but we then realized that it was just too, it was unnecessary because the bottom line of a KPI is to be able to turn work product into uh, numbers, right? So that at the end of the day, everyone gets a score. Uh, and, and it's not a problem if, if the score is low or it's not as expected, but it indicates that there's a work on work to do in the performance of that particular person. Okay, that's wonderful. And I see mm -hmm. Victoria included in the chat that uh, she works in retail and that they have those in retail as well. Yes, they're very, KPIs are very hot right now, right? Everyone is using them. And I feel that at one point they will go out the window and be replaced by something else that is probably easier to come up with. Uh, because KPIs do take a lot of thinking in exactly what the the key indicator is going to be, but right now that has been the the trend. Um, one down thing, or well, I like KPIs. I think that they offer a really great like broad frame of, at least for me, for my team who is doing well and who needs a little bit more help with training and role playing and things like that. The one thing that I've noticed with my team that I don't really like is that because it's so numbers driven, it can make um, certain people in a team feel like not attacked, but like you said, embarrassed or they don't really want to ask for help because everyone can see that they're not necessarily performing as highly as someone else. So that's the one thing I don't really like. Yes, and I agree with you, uh, Victoria. At least um, I personally don't share everyone else's KPI. We've developed a way in which everyone has their own sheet. So I have access to everyone's numbers, but it's just a personal type of uh, uh, measuring method. But when it comes to sales, I'm sure that there is a com competitive you know, competition factor there that, that also comes into play. Um, okay, so I guess one last question that I have is um, any words of advice for anyone considering working as a project manager? Any, I know that some of our students are going to um, go more in the like instructional design developer role. Um, mm -hmm. and, but I also have several students who are very much interested in being, you know, that project manager and seeing, being the person that oversees a project. Mm -hmm. So what is something that you would recommend somebody who is currently in graduate school or just like in general uh, skills that they should develop over time to, to get to that point of being a, a project manager? Yes, absolutely. So I think um, number one is there are a ton of project management certification types right now, which uh, may not necessarily make anyone a project manager. So I personally think that there are some people who, who learn to be a project manager and there are some other groups that are just natural born project managers and may not need the certification. However, it does help with credibility. So I would, uh, especially if you're a, a very young professional, um, I would probably suggest to look into those possibilities uh, if, if it's within range. I would also advise not to get into it for, for the money necessarily because project management is uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. It can be very intense. And in the long run, for some people, it may not be what they want. It may not be exactly sustainable. So you have to like the rush of uh, constantly having something going on, dealing with deadlines has to be okay uh, for your personality type and, and dealing with, with people and, 
I, I don't like the word stress. I think the word stress is overrated, but with sometimes it's good, a little bit of stress, but to consider that factor as well, and it's not for everybody. Also, ensuring that you have a full understanding of what the, if you do go into project management, what are your short-term and your long-term expectations before you get into it. Um, and if you do become a project manager, making sure that you work with tools that work for you, for your organizational vision and everyone. I mean, it's as simple as some people are color coded and some others aren't. It's what's going to work for you, right? Um, so working with the right systems and seeing what's in trend, what your customer base will be more attracted to, um, trying learn to work with uh, deadlines to to you know try to divert from from schedule as little as possible, um, and knowing how to review progress and and work with with other people, um, and also never ever stop testing. So every step. Every single thing that you do within a project, I always recommend to test right away. Um, that happens a lot at the company I work for. We develop uh, products within our platform for different clients. And sometimes if you don't test one little thing at the end of a project, three months down the road, um, you find that that one thing didn't work and everything else falls apart. So. That's important, and um, well, and KPIs, in my opinion, are also a good component of of becoming a a, a project manager. So it's good to kind of wrap your head around those components. Thank you so much, Adriana. We were actually just talking um, about the project scope mm -hmm. and uh, figuring the um, uh, activities that were going to be part of the project scope and we had a conversation about evaluation and how evaluate, well, you know, evaluation is a huge part of instructional design. Yes. So we were thinking about like having evaluation in all the different phases um, that were going to be detailed in the project scope on how it is really important to evaluate constantly. So we don't have yes. to do it at the end. So exactly. And on a per stage basis, sometimes it's a lot better than at the end, depending on the project also. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, for talking to us about your project management experience and just kind of giving us an idea from um, the corporate sector and also coming from a different field um, on logistics, but also you have some experience in training. So all of this is great for us to, to learn and talk and discuss. Um, just one last, are there any last questions? No, I think you addressed them all very well. And I also appreciate your presentation. It was uh, encouraging to see you use RICE uh, because uh, we, we encourage the students to, to use um, the Articulate Suite. So that's pretty awesome. And I'm so glad that Teddy's kind of like uh, helping um, make this happen at, at your organization. He, he's amazing. He's done so many uh, good things for the company. Right now he's in charge of our company intranet as well. And he's coming up with uh, different content for, for us on a weekly basis, plus helping um, our content manager uh, create trainings for, for an overseas office that we now have. So um, it's, it's been great working with him. And also thank you so much for inviting me and very great meeting uh, your, your students. Wonderful. Well, um, since this has been recorded, I'll probably forward a, the recording link to you tomorrow. Um, okay. And again, just thank you for joining our classroom. We really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank you. Everyone. It's been a pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>